everyone. It's Brian Harmon, President and CEO of the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, here for the next installment of the Powerhouse Podcast, joined once again by my trusty co-host, Dr. Phil Yeski. Hello, everybody. Dr. Yeski, you were off last month. We had Cassie, our esteemed producer, on with us. She did a fabulous job. Do I look well rested? You look well rested. Uh, but I, And I know you need your rest because you're globe trotting here real soon. You're heading off to Europe next yes. week. If airs, you're probably there. Tell us about what's uh, going on. Yeah, true. But uh, uh, within a few hours, I'll be uh, stepping into an airplane and uh, jetting over to uh, England uh, to participate in the Welcome Trust Mitochondrial Medicine Conference. Um, this is my first time there in person since 2019, mm -hmm. right? There was the pandemic gap years. I hadn't was, heard about that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so they dealt with the, the same issues we dealt with in terms yeah. of planning meetings and bringing people together. Um, but it's always a great opportunity to really connect uh, with the international mitochondrial research community. Such an important part of what we try to do here at UMDF that while we are a U.S. focused organization, we pride ourselves on having a global footprint mm -hmm. and, and really being good collaborators with uh, all the key folks uh, from around the world. So looking forward to catching up in person with uh, uh, many people. Yeah, for, for the uninitiated, Phil, what, what is, what's the Welcome Trust? Yeah, Welcome Trust is a large philanthropic uh, uh, organization. So you might say akin to like the, you know, the, um, um, sorry, drawing a blank, uh, um, um, Microsoft guy. Uh, yeah, Bill Gates. Bill, Bill Gates. Gates oh, there you go. That's all right. Woo. Yeah, maybe a little more coffee before I fly. Yeah, we, yes. we won't have Jeff edit that out. It's in the blooper <laughs> reel, at least, but go ahead. So like the Gates Foundation here or Chan Zuckerberg initiative, right? So sort of these large philanthropic arms. So the, uh, the welcome is W-E-L-L-C-O-M-E -E, uh, mm -hmm. and a family that um, uh, did a lot of pharmaceutical development, um, and uh, created a trust uh, to um, put the, their uh, donations uh, to work. And so they play a major role in sponsoring research, but principally within UK, but also uh, outside of it. So they are hosting the meeting. How fortunate we are in the rare disease community to have donors who are looking at making big global impact on this. And I know, you know, UMDF is certainly an organization that has benefited from yeah. Folks who think really big and put their resources to work for, in our case, advancing therapies for patients. Yeah, it, it, it's critical, right, that we have the, uh, you know, the involvement of groups like that that have uh, resources. Um, they have the ability to bring people together, um, you know, to, to drive discussion and set shared priorities. So um, the, this is a very professionally run uh, conference and um, yeah, again, I really look forward to uh, interacting with uh, a bro broad range of people while there. Your uh, your duty as a um, tossing up great segues is always on on the mark. You know, like you talk about professionally run conferences, of course. That's what the month off affords. Well, there we go. Right, our our uh, own conference coming up here at the end of June of an event that um, we're always proud to bring the community together to bring the best in science and. Of course, the patient families to come and be educated and connect with each other. Uh, planning is well underway. I know there's some new and exciting things that are happening. We're always looking at ways to keep this fresh. Something yeah. that was new last year was our clinical research pavilion, right. and we're bringing that back this year. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we were really thrilled to get started last year with uh, engaging the, the patient community in clinical research at the conference. Um, and so this pavilion is meant to be a place where uh, research studies can be housed uh, and then patients can sign up to come in to really experience what it's like to participate in clinical research. So uh, a couple of big benefits from that. One, uh, obviously you're generating data, you're bringing, we're bringing more patients together than anybody, uh, you know, at least in a, in a U.S. conference. So it's a really good opportunity, right, to just learn from the patients and collect data. So data collection. But secondly, I think it's just as important that it's part of, of creating this culture of clinical trials mm -hmm. in our community and for the patient community 
maybe they're not ready to participate quite yet, or they have questions about participating in an interventional trial where an actual mm-hmm. drug is being tested, right? That they would be a part of a trial like that. But this is clinical research as well. And so what's it mean to come in and complete an informed consent, right? So that you understand what it is you're doing. How are outcome measures conducted? What are the sorts of things you might be asked to do if you participated in an interventional clinical trial? Um, We will need 100% engagement of the patient community in order to get to the treatments and cures that we all want for our mitochondrial disease patients. So we see this as just another way for people to learn about clinical research. And hopefully when that opportunity comes along that's relevant to them, they're a good candidate to participate in a clinical trial, they feel less of a barrier right. to, to, to participating. Being research ready and, and to that end, we're, we're working on programming for Thursday. This is new for us this year of bringing in um, the patient community to be educated on clinical trials, demystifying research a little bit, their unique role in advancing mm-hmm. therapies. Mm-hmm. We know there's a little bit of army of one here. It comes down to that individual patient family and, and um, their ability to be engaged in, in trials to help like move that. Yeah, forward. Right. You know, I think we, we, we have to connect with people in many different ways, right? So yeah. that's actually a perfect segue, if you will, right? To talk about demystifying research, some case studies, how other disease communities are progressing therapeutic development, the failures they've had, the successes they've had, you know, sort of learning, right, about all of that. Again, my hope would be that just lowers the barrier a little bit. That yep. coming out of that session, they might say, I'm going to go check out that clinical research pavilion, right? And yep. just see, see what it's about. Uh, we promise that uh, uh, everybody involved will work to make it a positive experience. And, but we're always keen to hear the feedback of the patient community as to, you know, are we hitting the mark, right, with doing this? Or what are your suggestions of how we can do it better? Yeah, you know, one of the things we can always do better at UMDF is find ways to showcase hope. And I think the, I'm particularly excited about the, these case studies that we're going to be bringing to the conference. Our friends at the American Perfurious Foundation is one group that will be there that is on a similar grind to the mitochondrial disease community. And it's the only way we can really describe it. It, it is a grind. We acknowledge that. Um, and of course, particularly for the patient families that we serve, but to be able to bring in groups who are on a similar journey and um, found a pathway to some initial therapies um, is exciting. It's inspiring. And that's part of what the conference is all about is to yeah. demonstrate hope and, and keep us at the ready and galvanized for when these windows open, we can move quickly. Uh, make no mistake about it, right? There are windows of opportunity, and we have to be we have to be nimble as a community to be, be responsive. Um, um, you know, the the worst possible outcome, right, is to uh, have an opportunity pass by just because we were unable, right, to um, you know a, a, to mobilize, right, as patient advocacy group, as a patient community, as clinicians, right, the all of the stakeholders that were unable to respond, right, to, to that opportunity, um, and it's gone by. The, that that's the worst possible outcome. But one of those stakeholder groups that always inspires us, of course, are the docs who are at the bench. The docs who are at the bedside. We're heading into National Doctors' Day, is in the month of March, so a time to celebrate all of our doctors. It's also Brain Awareness Week um, coming up here next week as well, too, and. We thought it was very fitting for today's guests and the, the month where we celebrate doctors, we celebrate brain awareness to bring on a very special guest to talk about his own journey in the field and, and what he sees, what inspires him. We're pleased today to be joined by Dr. Devaker Mithil. He's an assistant professor of pediatrics and neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and an attending physician in neurocritical care and neurogenetics in the section of neurology at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. He is also the Founders Board Neurocritical Care Research Fellow at Lurie Children's Hospital, where he focuses on advancing mitochondrial disease research. Dr. Mithil completed an undergraduate degree in brain and cognitive sciences from MIT, followed by a combined MD-PhD degree at Northwestern University. Dr. Mithil, welcome. Hi, it's nice to meet you guys on on the screen. Uh, It's a pretty... It's a lot of introduction. Well, we need to have, I think we need to have a podcast just to read your bio. Would that be okay? 
<laughs> I was teasing. I was teasing ahead of time in our little pre-show, as I've teased famously on here before, of my C minus in biology, <laughs> and and we we quickly got down a path around, um, you know, the what we all know the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and, and you were just sharing a quick little story of how you immediately well, put it into your own promotion of the mito world. Yeah, I mean that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's a really sticky statement. Everyone seems to know it. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with the background of how that became such a viral thing? No. Oh, I love how this is starting already. Yeah. Oh, so this is great. Um, I think, not going to make any judgments here, but we all might be old enough or maybe even too old. It's hard to know sometimes with the internet uh, to remember something called Tumblr. Yes. Oh, yes. Tumblr predates all of the current social media and is defunct. But on Tumblr, there was some user who um, made a meme, like a, a GIF or some kind of picture that said the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Now, this is something that had been coined years ago um, and uh, has been taught essentially in every high school in the country. And the purpose of the meme was to highlight how little he had learned in high school. <laughs> <laughs> like this was the only thing he remembered. And so when people say that, I don't know if they realize, oops, I don't know if they realize that they are referencing a meme that's actually a reflection of how little we know. Yeah. As opposed to an actual fact that's important. Um, interesting. And it's I, very, very interesting. <laughs> and, you know, this is on, it's in Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, well, but uh, but I, I, um, I've used that actually as like an intro to the um, first year medical school. I, I teach them about mitochondrial disease really within the first month of when they arrive on campus, which is another thing we can talk about how cool yeah. that is. But um, it's also the only lecture they get on mitochondrial disease. So I really got to make it stick. And so I try right before the lecture, about 10 minutes or so to take a screenshot from social media. Uh, I just type in mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and see what's been posted. And usually there's like three or four posts in the last couple of hours and certainly 10 or 15 in the last 24 hours that all it says is mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell with no context. Hmm. And I have yeah. no idea why this is so sticky so far out but it's just something people feel like saying all the time. And it's unfortunately I, far too narrow, right? <laughs> in the, in the scope, right? When we know all the biological processes that mitochondria are involved with. Uh, well, our house um, is an important This is our marketing one. campaign. Our it's more than the powerhouse of the cell. And it's yeah. why I introduced it, the lecture that way, because I say, listen, I'm not going to have time to go into all the biology, the advances that we've made. It is a wonderful catchphrase, and it actually tells you a lot about the mitochondria but it tells you very little about how complex it is. And um, so I try to weave it in throughout that, like, this is a good time to think of it this way. This is a bad time to think of it this way. Um, but I, it, I it is certainly- This, this is a, a golden nugget already of this conversation. <laughs> Andy and Cassie from our marketing team who are producing behind the scenes are feverishly writing down notes. This is a brilliant <laughs> campaign about how it's more than the, than the powerhouse of the cell. I will say, anytime someone famous or someone beyond Phil and I say it, I get texts from all my staff of, hey, TJ Watt from the Pittsburgh Steelers and Cam Hayworth from the Pittsburgh Steelers just said powerhouse is out. We went and made them t-shirts and shipped them off to them. Awesome. This is also a shameless plug to get our friends on, in the celebrity circuit to be talking about it. But all kidding aside, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on that front. And, and we're going to get to that. I want to make sure we dive a little bit deeper in terms of kind of what you're seeing from an education standpoint, what we can be doing. Let's take, let's take it back though, to how you got your start. Let's let's hear the Dr. Mythol origin story. How did you find your way into, into the this field? How much time you guys got today? Let's <laughs> go. Um, so honestly, I, um, I, I, there's a lot of converging threads here, but, but the bottom line is that um, many years ago when I was in high school, probably, um, I started to get interested in the brain uh, as, as a, as as something that was just fascinating to me. I mean, I was primarily interested in language and consciousness. And so it was more, um, you know, the functions of the brain that I was interested in. But when I got to MIT, um, it turned out there was a major for people that were interested in the brain. It was called brain and cognitive sciences. And that, um, you know, a few too many puns here, but that blew my mind. And I, I just couldn't believe that I could spend like the rest of my life being in a, what was called a neuroscientist. Um, and so I did that and I had no intention of being a doctor. Uh, I had every intention of studying human consciousness. Uh, so not even like animal studies or, or genetics or anything like that. I just wanted to study how consciousness worked. And I, I can't remember who it was, the first person, but it wasn't the last person. Many PhD tenured professors across the country told me that 
smart people don't study consciousness. It's just too hard. <laughs> and um, I don't want to admit that they're right, but there, there's many challenges even to finding consciousness. And I think along the way, one of the things that became sort of mystifying to me was how um, variable human experience can be and how just the whole idea that somebody who doesn't appear to be uh, a, a sort of a typical human being, you know, maybe they don't communicate the same way, maybe they have uh, neurologic injuries, maybe they have some other um, uh, neuro, uh, atypical neurologic phenotype, they experience life differently than we do. It doesn't make them not human. I mean, it makes their consciousness different in some way, perhaps. Um, but those differences started to really get at me a little bit. And I started to wonder, like, how can we help people that are really challenged in society? And that sort of took me a little bit more down the medical pathway, which I can tell you about. However, I should say <laughs> that, um, independently of this, obviously it's not independent. I just didn't realize they were connected. Um, I spent every summer in my childhood uh, in India for three months. We'd leave the day after school ended, came back the day before school started. And uh, we'd go to my mom's hometown in Kanpur, which is in the central, north central part of India, Uttar Pradesh, not far from like the Taj Mahal. And um, there's lots of great things I could tell you about that. But the relevant thing is that my mother's mother, so my maternal grandmother, um, had been really involved in Indian independence and women's rights at the time of Indian independence. And one of the things she realized was that a lot of women uh, who had children with um, neuro disabilities had to stay home to take care of them and it prevented them from ever getting out of the home. And it was really stigmatized, both the children and the women not leaving uh, their children at home, both, both aspects. And so she thought she had learned that there were schools in the West for children with these uh, disabilities. And so she started a school philanthropically um, in Kanpur. And so I used to spend a lot of time at this school for children with what was called cerebral palsy or mm. really spastic children, uh, which is an atypical term nowadays, but it was called the center for children, um, the spastic center for children. And um, I used to go there a lot and I'd spend time with these neuro atypical children. And um, I don't think I really thought of it as like a educational experience. It was more just something I did in the summer because I had like no TV, no video game. <laughs> I read books a lot, but um, there's something to do. And I, I remember feeling like very uncomfortable at first, but as time went by, you know, it became somewhat normalized. And um, that I'm sure informed some of this approach to medical uh, care. And it all kind of came together when I was in medical school. And I found out, similar to when I found out that there was like a major for brain science, I found out that there was a medical practice for people who wanted to take care of children with neurological disease called child neurology. Mm. Again, had no idea. Uh, I, I'm going to come across as very clueless about a lot of things, but um, <laughs> you're in good company. Don't worry. <laughs> you're on. No, and so I'm writing my essay, you know, uh, as you do for college, you also do for residency. I'm writing my personal statement. And as I'm writing it, I'm like, wait a minute, I've been thinking about this stuff since I was a kid. And um, it all kind of came together, the neuroscience, the child neurology part of it. Um, and, uh, it just, that's how I got into child neurology, how I got into mitochondrial disease is, is an extension of that story, but that's really how I got into pediatric neurology and how I took my scientific background and pursued an MD PhD to be relevant to child neurology. How fortunate for you, right? That you were able to find a passion that developed out of your experiences, even from a young age. Yeah. I'm a lucky guy. There's no question. Yeah. yeah. yeah I wanted to dive into that a little bit. I, I wrote down as you were talking, there's kind of this empathy pedigree that was built. And I'm just, you know, curious, there's, there's a, always a certain mystique with, with the docs in our world. And, you know, we, we always like to showcase a little bit of like, you know, our, our docs go home, they cook dinner with their families and they go on fishing trips and they, they do karate afterwards. They're, they're just like us too. Um, and they empathize. And, and I want to just talk a little bit about the role of empathy in, in your world from both a care and research standpoint. Just talk to me kind of what that what that means for you, what you learned at a young age and how you've applied that to your profession. Yeah. No, that's that's really insightful. I mean, there's two things I want to touch on, both what Bill said and what you said, Brian. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to have had this these experiences sort of coalesce into helping me find a path. I mean, I think in a way that's a privilege we don't talk about a lot. You know, people don't get mm -hmm. to choose their path. They sometimes have to do what's necessary to survive. And I certainly didn't. I was protected um, from that uh, by the successes of my uh, parents and my grandparents, et cetera. And also just the luck of birth. I mean, whoever they were born to. Um, and so that that goes back to this term pedigree that you you referred to. I think there is an empathy pedigree. And I'm really grateful for that because um, my mother's side of the family did come from 
landowners uh, and successful. I mean, my great grandfather was a great lawyer, um, and and those kinds of things do beget uh, uh, some kind of status and and wealth that can. Um, they don't have to be used for good things, right? Like people mm -hmm. don't do that. But I do think my grandmother, um, who was married at the age of 16 and left home and, and never went back home, she was actually born in what's now Pakistan. And so she moved to India, Kanpur, where my mom was born, and never went home. She dedicated her life uh, to to philanthropy. Um, and, and, and not just philanthropy in the sense that she gave money, she actually, you know, ran these organizations. And um, that was a big part of my childhood. I mean, that was a huge identity. My, my grandfather... Uh, did not come from the same kind of pedigree, but also, you know, land owning stuff. And he ran a hotel uh, on our property that he had built. Um, and it wasn't like a huge moneymaker, but just having the property alone was was a lot in India. Um, but he gave her the freedom to, which is very atypical in the, in the 50s and 60s, to drive her car <laughs> to the office and run the show for these like uh, massive organizations that were all um, philanthropic. In fact, my dad when he was in college, he got a letter from my grandma. This is before he ever knew anything about my mom or, or, or about our family or anything like that. Um, he got a letter soliciting students to go to rural India to help with uh, famine and, and malnutrition, like on a summer break to just like go and be a soldier to help. Mm. And it was from my grandmother. It's like signed by her. Um, and so he showed it to her many years later because he put two and two together. Uh, but she was really involved. And I think that was a big you know, I don't know that I, I can't say that I like pursued a, a, a truly uh, philanthropic endeavor from day one. I, I certainly was looking out for things I was interested in and, and, and got to do that. But yeah, that that notion that empathy sort of drove a lot of the motivation was there. And it is manifest in my mother. My mother absolutely lives that life. She helps everyone around her all the time. Um, and then, you know, if we're being really honest about it, I think um, I'm not a religious person by any means but I was raised in the Hindu tradition or faith, um, which is, I, I should just say as a side note, Hinduism is not a, mo a monolithic thing. It is highly de variable depending on who you are and where you are. And my relationship with it is more like a philosophy mm -hmm. and a big uh, core sort of ideas is this idea that um, we're all human, we're all part of one entity, which is life. And I, I think my, my grandparents, all four of them, really believed in that notion and really believed in the idea that there was no distinguishing one from another that we're all in this together. Um, and I think that breeds a lot of empathy if you look at things that way. So I don't know. Right. This is great. We've never gone into the metaphysical. <laughs> we, we have it. Yes. It's, it's, uh, didn't know what you guys were saying before. And we're uh, recording yeah. this on a Friday. Like I, you know, I would just I think I'd power through a couple of emails today. We hope you're enjoying the episode. The United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation's Mitochondrial Medicine Conference brings together researchers, clinicians, and patient families to work toward better outcomes for patients with mitochondrial diseases. Join us this year in Cleveland. Visit umdfconference.org. Let's get you back to the powerhouse. So, Dr. Mithal, you talked a little bit about how you're you know, your experiences and your childhood really informed an ultimate decision to, to go to medical school and, and, and eventually to perhaps even become a neurologist. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that journey from learning about neurology to ultimately uh, getting a greater interest in mitochondria and mitochondrial disease. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that, that, again, was something that I didn't at all see coming, even though I was now, I found this child neurology pathway, which has been really fruitful and wonderful, and I, I, I would never pick another field. Um, but during my training, so the training for child neurology involves both pediatrics and neurology, and then um, you sort of mesh it together and become a, a pediatric neurologist. And during this time, um, as, as a scientist, somebody who'd done a PhD, I was really fascinated by the variety of different types of diseases that we saw in child neurology. And a lot of them, probably more than I was led to believe, and maybe more than we knew at the time when I was training, um, a lot of them were genetic in nature. So that just a, a, a one gene, abnormal, so what we call a monogenic disorder. And um, whether it was epilepsy or a movement disorder, or uh, what we're going to talk about next, a neurodegenerative condition, uh, they all seem to have these genes that cause things. And, you know, as a scientist, I was like, <laughs> we do experiments where we manipulate one gene in a mouse 
And then we say, that's a, a, an experiment. Mm -hmm. And I had, I perhaps again, I was naive about this, but I hadn't really realized that like, that's actually human disease in, in, in a nutshell, uh, that many, many children are afflicted by monogenic one gene manipulated and, and there's a problem. And um, if you think about the way we talk about these disorders, we, we say, okay, there's a movement disorder or there's epilepsy or there's um, uh, what, sometimes like a demyelinating condition or uh, like I said, neurodegeneration, but we don't really talk about why that's what's happening. So mm -hmm. epilepsy is just a bunch of seizures. There's a lot of assumptions as to why people have seizures, but if you look at the variety of reasons, I mean, the number one cause for seizures worldwide is neurosister sarcosis, which is a, a, a um, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bug basically, uh, a parasite uh, that burrows into your brain and causes problems. We don't have it in the United States because of hygiene, but worldwide, that's the number one cause of seizures. Interesting. We have genetic causes, we have tumors, we have brain injuries, all kinds of reasons why people have seizures. So why do these single gene disorders cause seizures? And that dives deep into science about why, what is so critically important about these genes. Same thing can be said for a movement disorder or for a, a degenerative condition. And so I was just, you know, mesmerized by the idea of doing something, what we call neurogenetics, understanding the link between genes and brain disease. And um, as I got through my training, so again, it's a five-year training program. As I went through, one of the groups of patients that I started to notice had debilitating disease and literally nothing uh, that was offered to them in terms of treatment was patients with mitochondrial disease. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my initial in, in interaction with, with these patients was really, um, I, I'm going to use a, a pretty harsh term, was, um, was, was flimsy, was uh, um, superficial. You know, I, I would say, okay, you have a mitochondrial disease. Um, you know, I talked to my attendings about it. I, we'd say there's really bad outcomes uh, for the most part. And I just didn't have a language to use to describe what was going to come next. And I felt that lack of... You know, talk about empathy, I felt a lack of empathy because I really didn't understand what was going on. And I didn't, as a scientist, feel like I had any grounding. The more I learned about mitochondria, the less I understood about the disease. And I felt like it just kept coming back to that uh, powerhouse of the cell idea that is this really all just related to not producing enough ATP, which is essentially what I was told, to be quite frank. I mean, that is really what I was taught. And yeah. so that, as a scientist, again, sort of pushed me to think a little differently about it and say, what do we know? What do we not know? And um, I, I can stop there and say, I realized we didn't know a lot. And um, it was towards the end of my training that I came across the UMDF. Uh, and I had come across a couple of people at Northwestern, in particular, Nav Chandel, who were studying mitochondria in really fascinating and innovative ways. Yeah. And uh, I just felt like there was something there that uh, was worth pursuing. And uh, I wrote a grant when I was a fourth year resident um, through the NINDS and the adult neurology department at Northwestern. Um, to help get some protected time to do research on on some questions. And um, that was really the first foothold. Um, so my mentor, Dr. Chandel, I actually knew him for uh, many years before he was my scientific mentor, but we had bonded over soccer. We both really like uh, soccer. He plays still somehow. I, I've given it up a long time ago, although I do love it. Coach my kids' teams now. Um, but we both love soccer and we would actually, my PhD mentor, uh, Richard Miller, was really into soccer as well. He's an Englishman, football, and uh, he and I are both Arsenal fans. And it turns out that um, so is Dr. Chandel. And uh, we would all get together and watch those matches. And so I knew him socially. And I, I was not interested in his research in mitochondria at all until I was. And then when I was, I knew who to go talk to about it. And um, he was very receptive and supportive. Uh, but it just tells you that those, those connections that you can make with people uh, you never know how they're going to influence you. And I'm sure somehow he influenced me on being interested in mitochondria, or at least prepared me to be interested in them, um, even if I wasn't at the time when I was a PhD student and had gotten to know him. Um, and, you know, similarly, I, when I was a kid, um, my parents bought a house that was bigger than they needed um, and, and needed to also bigger than they could probably afford. And so they needed to rent out some of the rooms uh, to tenants. And so we had a couple of people who kind of became like family to us um, over the years. And one of them um, was a woman named Lakshmi, who I call Didi, Lakshmi Didi, she's like a sister. Um, <laughs> some years after she'd lived with us, she had moved on to bigger and better things in her life. Her cousin came um, to Boston, moved to Boston and came and would visit us uh, at our house. And um, he 
was younger than my parents, um, but was in medicine and was like looking for mentorship and guidance uh, in this new city and sort of um, became pretty close to my parents, uh, sort of like surrogate parents for him. He was just old enough, uh, older than me. You know, I was probably like late, like early high school, maybe middle school, uh, maybe even a little later. I don't know. Just old enough that I like wasn't interested <laughs> in him at all. And um, as the years went by, I found out that, oh man, this guy, he's really, really good at mitochondrial research and we chat about it. And similarly, I'd be like, don't care about mitochondria, uh, but good for you. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you're so successful. And this guy turned out to be Vamsi Muta, who um, uh, many people know around here. So both Vamsi and Nav have been influential as, as friends, as, as good people, uh, before I ever cared about what they did uh, scientifically. And, and I'm sure, again, they're, they're both very inspirational people, and they both probably inspired me in different ways. Um, but I feel grateful now to be able to work with them, uh, particularly Nav, he's my mentor. Um, but, you know, Vamsi has been instrumental at the UMBF. So uh, these, <laughs> I don't know what, quite what to make of these stories, but I think um, we talk a lot about different threads and how they weave together to make you who you are. And uh, I view it as a lot of good luck, but um, I also am really grateful for it. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that it, it, it sounds like your experience in the clinic, right, as a resident, really helped to inform the research field that you want to go into right, and pursue a PhD. And so maybe you could just talk a little bit about that and some of the specific directions your research has taken you. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so I, at the end of, <laughs> there's a little bit of conflict here again, because the way things are structured clinically is not necessarily linked to the way things are structured research-wise. Yeah. Clinically, you got to finish a residency. If you're gonna do a fellowship, do a fellowship and then start practicing. Research-wise, you got to do a bunch of research, publish a bunch of papers, write some grants, and then do your research. Mm -hmm. And those things are supposed to all happen together. And yeah, a little more open-ended, right? <laughs> um, and uh, at some point, you know, somebody like myself, I'm curious about a lot of things. You got to pick something. And like I said, this mitochondrial thing became very interesting to me. And one of the things I'll, I'll just say is that, um, one of the big tools in neurology is, is getting an MRI, you know, get a picture of the brain and patients with severe mitochondrial disease. There's a, there's a range of mitochondrial disease and I don't want to downplay any of them. Um, but the ones that affect the brain in the most severe way, the neurodegenerative forms of it have really fascinating and complex MRIs, but the radiologist will almost universally read it as, um, you know, some specific things, symmetric lesions, this, that consider metabolic or genetic disorder. Right. It's, it's, it's essentially the same right. every single time. Yeah. Right. And um, to me, those patterns look different. They're, you can use the same descriptors, but when you look at the picture, they look different. And I felt like there was a language missing there. And that was kind of my first hint that maybe the pathophysiology of these diseases, the things that make the disease a problem are different between different mitochondrial diseases. Maybe it's not all the same. It's just something similar. The mitochondria is the same <laughs> is shared, but what is actually wrong with the mitochondria might be different in each case. And um, that was the research idea. But the thing is that clinically, I was really interested in taking care of children in the ICU, in the critical care setting. And so we have, I'm very lucky again, uh, to be at, at Lurie Children's where we have a pediatric neurocritical care fellowship, which I did for one year. And so during that time, I'd, I'd been doing it as a trainee, but I got to focus on it for one year. During that time, I was, um, rather surprised again to see how many children in our ICU had genetic disorders. Um, that's not typically what a, an ICU doctor thinks about. Right. They think about like, okay, we need an airway to make sure they're breathing. Yeah, yeah, we need the trauma to yeah. make sure the heart's beating. But thinking about the underlying genetic diagnosis as part of the acute problem is really not something that happens. And I was sort of seeing this and I was thinking, man, these mitochondrial kids, they just come in and things go downhill so fast. And it's not because of normal biology. It's because of abnormal biology that's related to their underlying genetics. And um, so, so that was kind of where I wanted to take this long term. So the, then the question became, how do you sort of bridge these things between a basic science question, some clinical research, and sort of a long term vision of, of helping these kids in their most acute state? And um, I, I, I'm patching it together slowly. Um, but, the, but the most basic question I still have is what makes these um, different mitochondrial diseases uh, present with different sort of uh, patterns in the brain. And I, I think it's related to um, different neuronal, po different populations of neurons using mitochondria differently. And so I've kind of tried to focus on 
studying how neurons use mitochondria and what the essential functions are mm. uh, for mitochondria inside neurons. And then the goal is to do that for different types of neurons because you have lots of different kinds of neurons in your brain. And then in a, in a parallel world, mm -hmm. alongside this, you're launching a mito care clinic as well, too. Yeah. Right? So, I understand, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I finish... That. Um, Spare time. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is this is actually again like um, we talk about serendipity. We talk about being lucky. Um, also, uh, at any institute, wherever uh, this is just a, a general recommendation for any young trainees who are out there uh, who might be listening, um, it's worth talking to your leadership about your vision. You know, it, I had a really supportive uh, chair of pediatrics. Um, I had a really supportive division head for pediatric neurology, Dr. Epstein, who I've known since I was a medical student. And he saw my trajectory and he saw that this is something he wanted to invest in uh, time wise, resource wise. And so somewhere along this pathway, um, the idea of me being a neurocritical care attending uh, came up and that was something we both agreed would, is our mutual benefit. And then um, I wanted to start a clinic for children with mitochondrial disease because we didn't have that at Lurie. And as, as many of the listeners will know, there are some really prominent ones around the country. Um, I never wanted or necessarily expected to be uh, a prominent one. I just wanted to have something in Chicago. I mean, we have a massive city here and there's lots of people. And I thought it would be a reasonable thing to try to have some of those patients cohorted into one place. Um, and I wanted to do it in partnership with genetics in the long run, because I'm, I'm, I, I knew that I wouldn't ever really be able to do all the things necessary for a mitochondrial patient because I'm just a, I'm just a lowly neurologist. <laughs> so that, that was, Again, Dr. Epstein being really supportive in the Department of Pediatrics wanting this as well. So that aligned, uh, lucky, serendipity, n you name it. But it was, it was, um, it worked out well, but it, it was a lot of work. And, and to be honest with you, I definitely didn't see all the angles going in. I didn't understand uh, how many variables are, how best to serve the patients. Um, I think with anything, when you try it, you, part of it is you jump in. Um, if you jump in with both feet into a deep end of the pool and you can't swim, that's a problem. Right. I had enough uh, ability to swim where I, I kept afloat. Um, this is a bad analogy because I'm a bad swimmer. <laughs> but, but this is where the UMBF really does come in. And I, I, don't, I you know, I, I don't mean to to to, um, to promote the podcast that we're on, but. Oh, by all um, means, go ahead. <laughs> when I was a fifth year resident, um, I went to the Child Neurology Society meeting in Kansas City. And uh, the UMBF had a booth there uh, at the mm -hmm. Child Neurology Society. And um this is a random anecdote, but the night before uh, I saw, I met, I went to the booth. The night before was the first night of the conference, and there was uh, a, 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 a special interest group for neurocritical care. So I went to that because I do neurocritical care, and um, I was sitting uh, in the back row, and the row right in front of me was a gentleman who kept raising his hand and has had a lot of opinions uh, <laughs> and things, and um, I didn't agree with all of them. And um, at one point, he turned around and said, "Oh, you're the Lurie group." Um, you know, I'm from Lurie Children's. He's like, you're the Lurie group. Um, he's like, I knew you'd disagree with me on this. Oh, goodness. Uh, he's like, I, I know your, I know your former boss. And I was like, what? I know <laughs> who this person is, right? And so at some point he stands up and goes up to the microphone and says, uh, hi, I'm Dr. Sinetto from Seattle Children's. Oh, great. And I'm like, great. I still don't know who this person is, but I'm like, now I know his name. <laughs> uh, I'm going to track this guy down later. And, you know, why are you being so difficult with me? And so um, that I left the bat. Honestly, I didn't know him. And I was like, why is he talking to me like this? So familiar and so, um, so confident. <laughs> and then uh, the next day I go to the UMDF booth as I, I knew it was there and I wanted to go check it out. And he's there. And I'm like, right. why is this guy here? Like, you know, first neurocritical care, now mitochondria. Like, and so we start chatting and he's like the nicest, kindest person. He's like, I was just giving you guys a hard time because Mark Wainwright, had, who used to do neurocritical care at Lurie Children's was now their section head at, at Seattle. And so the, apparently they'd been doing a lot of things that we did and there was the same discussions. And so he kind of had a lot of insight into how I thought already, which was. That, that is the perfect embodiment of Dr. Toledo, <laughs> right? That he, he always keeps you on your toes. Like, always, like man. did he mean that? Or, <laughs> yeah, it hasn't changed in all these years. So, that is core. Um, um, so nice he, he said to me at that point, he's like, you should come to UMDF. And I was like, mm okay, I don't know what that means. So he told me about the organization. He said, you know, um, physician scientists who are interested in mitochondrial disease are rare, um, as rare as the diseases themselves. And, uh, 
you know, you seem to have a lot of motivation. And when I told him about the neurocritical care part of it, he's like, that's, that's like unique. I mean, you know, we use the unique word unique freely, but there really aren't people who are interested in that particular avenue of the disease. Um, there'd be a lot, I think, for you to learn and uh, a lot of opportunity there. And so um, I, there was a, a fishbowl and you had to like sign your name and put it in there. And then there's, they were going to like pull it out for a free registration. And somehow I won. Um, that's that's great. great. I remember this. I remember this very clearly, wow. right? <laughs> How excited some people were that, you know, this name came up and I'm totally <laughs> unfamiliar with, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. but that, after that, I made a lot of connections, uh, Dr. Parikh, who's local in, in the mito world. I mean, he's in Ohio, but it's like five hours, six hours away. But most of my patients were going to see either him or Dr. Cohen, uh, in yeah. Akron. And, um, I got to know the folks at CHOP. I got to know, uh, some of the people in Texas and, you know, just people were so friendly and welcoming. I got some people in Boston. Um, I have a colleague, Missy Walker, who's in Boston, who's also a pediatric neurologist, who's also, we're essentially at the same level. Um, she's a little, she's more successful than me, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> um, but she, uh, you know, had been coming for one or two years ahead of me. And so she um, got to know me. She's in Dr. Muta's lab, Fancy Muta's lab. And, um, you know, he's, he's obviously a huge name in mitochondria. So like just these connections that I got to make in my very first meeting were massive, massive experiences for me and hugely influential in how I thought about things and also inspirational in that I knew that there was an opportunity for me uh, as well. Uh, people were so welcoming. And as the years have gone by, that's only grown. I've obviously gotten a lot more um, personal experience with taking care of patients. Uh, I, I leveraged Dr. Parikh very heavily uh, in trying to get the clinic up and running. Um, and then I've tried to execute plans that some of his patients have that are just local. And that has taught me a lot about how to manage patients. So now when I have my own new patients, I have templates to work with and experience to um, go back on. And then with the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, uh, Dr. Koenig runs it. Um, I'm, I have people I can ask questions to all the time. So it's really been a lot of growth, but uh, in parallel with the research, it's been um, fulfilling. And it really yeah, it's been really been whirlwind. It's not that long, right? You right. said 2015 was the first time you came. Or is that 2000, right? it was later than that, uh, 2018. Wow. Yeah. And so, Brian, uh, just to sort of assure you that uh, we're paying attention to the landscape and who the rising stars are in mitochondrial disease, I think Dr. Mithil and I would uh, like to share that he is joining the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board of UMDF uh, I, this year. Certainly and word, and we are delighted we're, to have him. Really board. thrilled to, to have his expertise. Um, you know, Brian, you know how important it is to me that we continue to have fresh perspectives and think about something as complex as mitochondrial disease clinically, scientifically, in new ways. And, um, you know, very representative of the, the type of, of personality, you know, collaborative, eager to, to find out. I mean, it's very clear you have the most important gene and that's the why, right? You know, help me understand why, you know, a, a part of it that uh, I really think you're going to deliver a lot of value and advice to us uh, in this role. So thank you uh, for, for agreeing to that. It's very kind of you. I, I can't tell you how honored I am. I mean, this has been, it is a whirlwind, but it's been um, very heavily influenced by the UMDF and I, I can't help, I can't wait to help uh, the vision. Super. Thank you for listening to the Powerhouse Podcast. Join us as we take every step toward treatments for mitochondrial diseases. Together, let's energize the fight. Register online at energyforlifewalk.org. Now, back to the Powerhouse. So Dr. Mithloy, as, as you've told your story, there have been multiple examples of the importance of mentors, right, and collaborators that have helped to form who you are and have, you know, allowed you to now kind of set your trajectory within uh, as a clinician and as a researcher. Um, I'm pretty certain that uh, you're you're paying this back in, in many ways. I know this is of an interest to you, so maybe you can just talk about how you try to mentor young investigators, uh, young clinicians in a, in a similar way. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, very important for me. I, I, I aspire to be a good mentor. I mean, I think at this moment in time, I, I would say I'm learning uh, how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, let me start out by saying two things. One is that um, going back to 
my high school, college, medical education, I just didn't learn very much about mitochondria at all. And, and quite frankly, um, if we're being very honest about it, and I say this at the beginning of my medical school lecture, um, I didn't care. Hmm. I, I really didn't. I, I was not interested in mitochondria. I had heard of famous people uh, that studied mitochondria, and I was like, good for you. Uh, that's <laughs> wonderful. And um, I didn't understand the relevance, to be quite frank about it. I, to me, it was like just this thing that was in a cell. And I was like, neurons are much more interesting. What do the neurons do? Tell me about the neurons. And so that, that was just the story of my life until uh, I got interested in the disease. And so what I try to do, and I, I, I think there's two threads to this, so I'll try to tie them together. What I try to do is um, expose people to that thought process that I had about why the mitochondria are actually really, really interesting, no matter what part of the body you're interested in and what part of health or what part of life, whether it's pediatrics or adult, the mitochondria play a really critical role. And the other part, which is really uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Chandel, as uh, influence here, and I try to, again, pay this forward as a mentor as well, is something you mentioned earlier, Phil, which is that there's just way more to mitochondria than ATP. Right. And it's not that ATP isn't important. It's obviously critically important. But um, there's a whole biology about mitochondria that um, is, is glossed over. And for somebody like me who uh, really relies on some kind of first principles to make my next steps and my next decisions. And what I mean by that is I need to understand what we're talking about before I start jumping to the next thing. And with mitochondria, I don't think I ever said what we were talking about. I just think it was like a thing. It was a, a diagram in a cell. Um, like my little kids, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. They have a book called Cell Biology for Babies, and there's like a little mitochondria in it. They're of like, course oh, they do. <laughs> oh, jelly bean, right? <laughs> yeah, the jelly bean. They can recognize it. Um, but how is that then any different than any of the other organelles in the cell? And if you're interested in one organelle, what makes that so special? Um, but I think it's completely different when it comes to mitochondria. And I, I'm not, I don't think I'm biased. I think the number of genes that are involved in the regulation of mitochondria, the fact that it has its own DNA, the fact that these diseases are so difficult to treat, all of these things come together to say, there's something about mitochondria that puts them in a slightly separate category than the organelles. And that's what I've been using as my motivation to be a good mentor and a good teacher is trying to find ways to not say, hey, I'm going to teach you something no one else knows about, hmm. but say, there's a lot of information out there and, and I'm trying to uh, motivate you to be interested in it. And we need the help, right? <laughs> Honestly, like the, the message there about, we think about a lot of this at UMDF of, of mm -hmm. finding and funding the next generation and getting more people interested in this space. But there's, all kidding aside, there's a little bit of a piece of that, of, of building excitement and, and yeah. galvanizing the next generation. Totally. I mean, I think, um, so with my child neurology residents, the current trainees that I have, um, I, I sometimes feel self-conscious that like I, I'm going back to these same ideas over and over again. Mm. Um, but I have to remind myself that they haven't gotten this education anywhere else. And that if there's even one of them that, who gets interested in it, that's good enough. You know, that's a, that's a good success. And then it also gives me the opportunity to practice on them <laughs> yeah. things that I can't say necessarily as freely because it's a much more casual setting when we're, I mean, it's not casual to be rounding, but we're doing things informally. Uh, but then I can sort of take things that they say, hey, this was really helpful and uh, incorporate them into lectures. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think at the medical school level, our medical school at Northwestern has done a really good job of introducing genetics very early because they view genetics as sort of a fundamental sea change. Our understanding of genetics is a fundamental sea change in medicine and that all students need to learn about genetics early. It's hard to carry that education through the four years of medical school and into residency because that's just not how the education is built. But they're trying to build foundation. So it is the foundations module. Mm -hmm. And I get to teach the mitochondrial lecture uh, at that time. I also get to teach immediately afterwards their introductory to their introduction to the patient exam. So mm -hmm. um, I don't teach the how to interview a patient, but I do a demonstration with one of my mitochondrial disease patients. Uh, uh, can, I, can I shout out his name? Of course. Course. Jeremy away. Millman has been my patient since I was a resident and he comes every year and uh, I get to interview him in front of everybody else with it. He comes with his mom wow. and um, the whole med whole first year medical school class sits there. Uh, it's about 150 kids, kids, students, um, <laughs> very highly accomplished students <laughs> who sit there and they um, watch as I sort of do a, a mock introduction. You know, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Mithil. Tell me about things. And Jeremy plays along. Um, and then he tells me a little bit about how he's been doing and what his symptoms are like. Um, 
And, uh, and then we talk, I talk with mom, I go over some of the history that I already know, but I act as though I don't. And so we just kind of role play this introduction thing. But the idea there is not necessarily to learn how to interview a patient, but rather how to set the scene for a specific kind of patient who has um, not your typical interaction skills, um, but is very engaging and quite mm. hilarious. Actually, he always gets the class laughing with some snide comment that he makes. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, you know, the students get to ask questions directly to the family, and, and I think that's a really wonderful opportunity. It serves multiple purposes. The first one is the educational purpose for which it was designed. But the second one is to cement some of the mitochondrial disease things that we talked about. I try to weave that in to the kind of questions that I ask. So you can see the link between your basic education and the clinical practice. And then the third one, which I think the most important one, is um, showing students that children with mitochondrial disease are not this uh, statistic in a textbook, that they are uh, human beings who live mm -hmm. lives, who are incredibly complex and wonderful human beings uh, in their own right, each one of them. Um, and that I've gotten to know one, been privileged to get to know one over the years who's now willing to come and share their story with these students. And that I wish that experience for everybody. I mean, I know we can't all have it, but um, it's a really special one. That's incredible. Well, I, yeah. I think Northwestern has given a great opportunity for that. And I appreciate that. Um, and it's, Jeremy is a great guy. So. I'm so glad to hear of so much growth in that. I mean, it's something we hear from from talking to so many professionals on this podcast and our daily work of um, the, the gap in education to know that there's there's steps being taken to improve. I mean, shout out to Jeremy for being a part of that solution. And shout out to you, Dr. Mithil, for all the good work you're doing on this front. Um, shout out to Cassie Franklin from our marketing staff who said, you got to interview this guy. Like he's <laughs> he's got really good stuff. And um, I want to give you kind of the 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 last um, the last words here. You know, what's what's inspiring you moving forward? What are you getting excited about? Any um, thoughts for the Mito community at large? Yeah, um, I'll just say one last thing about education, which I think is important, which is that a lot of the students who come into medical school also only know the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Mm. And so to that end, I think one thing that's really critical is to have better resources. I know the UMDF has done a great job of this, but um, I've, I've just been working with a new organization called Mitochondria World or mitoworld.org. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, their goal is to really have very concise, clear education tools on the website that you can just click through and learn stuff. Um, I, I think just general dissemination of knowledge is great because high school students picking this stuff up um, will go, it'll carry forward. Um, and so that's one thing that I see is that there's an interest out there and maybe not a total match between the interest and the resources. I think mm -hmm. if you get into mitochondria, it gets dense really quick and it doesn't necessarily have to, but it sort of falls upon us as a community to provide accessible information that's relevant. And to that end, one of the things I'm really excited about is a lot of people that I talk to nowadays going back to the idea about like what makes the organelle special. Um, there's been this model for years and years and years. If you go to any department uh, around the country, any university around the country, you'll find a cell and molecular biology department. Right. And if you think about it, that skips right over the mitochondria. There's a cell <laughs> and there's a molecule and there's somehow nothing in between. Uh, and part of the reason for that, I think, is that these subcellular organelles, lysosomes, ER, whatever, they are viewed as a structural component of the cell. And I think that's actually correct for the most part. But if you think of the mitochondria as having its own biology that needs to be integrated into these contexts, that really changes the framework and the opportunity as a researcher, because we get lumped into molecular or cellular or neuroscience or cardiology, or you name it, right? The focus is always on that thing, the cell, the molecule. It's never on the mitochondria. And so I've, this mitocentric view is something I, I find very appealing and something that the discourse is spreading uh, beyond UMDF, beyond the, the conferences where people talk about this kind of stuff. And even at those conferences, becoming more central to think of, you know, what is the mitochondria doing to regulate its environment, not vice versa? Um, hey, those other organelles don't have their own DNA. So we're a little special <laughs> here. <laughs> they don't have their own disease causing DNA that is super complex in its own way. So look, I think that's a really exciting development from a scientific standpoint, from a medical standpoint, um, you know, th this is a, it's a crazy time for pediatric neurology because we've had the first curable genetic disorder with spinomuscular atrophy. We literally, it's on the newborn screen. You identify children that have spinomuscular atrophy and you give them a gene therapy and it prevents them from developing disease if done, if all of that's done properly. 
And yeah, there it's not a hundred percent, but like this is a, a disease in its most severe form. Children died uh, at two years of age. And actually the, the clinical history of like how that therapy came to be, how it failed in adult trials and really was salvaged by these children who were dying and, and, and the physicians who advocated for them. That's a wonderful story in its own right and something we should take note of. But the point is these are gene therapies. These are therapies where you deliver a gene, it gets taken up by the motor neuron, it expresses that gene and the children don't develop symptoms. That is, we're gonna look back on this in hundred years and say that was an inflection point in medicine. And it happened while I was in training uh, yeah. within the last 10 years. And uh, most importantly, the most important part of that story is that it gave us hope even if it was somewhat irrational hope, because not all diseases are going to be treatable this way. Otherwise, we would have made a lot of advances much more quickly. But it, it told us that the human body allows you to introduce genes to manipulate disease, and it can tolerate those genes, and it can do wonderful things for health. And when we're talking about, going back to the beginning, monogenic disorders, disorders where we can find the gene that's causing the problem, whether we replace that gene or modify the function of that gene or boost something that's deficient because of that gene change, whatever the approach might be, it's coming. And it's mm -hmm. gonna happen in my lifetime, which means that there are children who are born now who it'll affect in some way. And hopefully it'll happen faster than that. I, I don't wanna put timelines on things, but I think we're mobilizing across neurogenetics, we're mobilizing across genetics, we're mobilizing across molecular sciences. And if we can get this mitocentric view to start kicking in, I think um, we'll have really directed therapies towards mitochondrial disease in, a, a somewhat accessible time frame, and I'm being vague on purpose. <laughs> of course. Well, you're, you're skilled in many areas, Dr. Mithil, and um, no exception to that is the best way to wrap a podcast. I thought you just <laughs> encapsulated um, exactly everything that, that we covered today. I'm grateful for what you're doing to, to brighten the horizon. You know, it's the way we kind of think about our jobs every single day is we got to just keep brightening that horizon. And um, it's inspiring for us as, as staff and as leaders of these organizations to be part of something that's that big and knowing we've got um, folks like you who are moving that forward. And also, as we've mentioned earlier, volunteering your time for an organization like ours um, and helping us chart our course. So for that, we're most grateful. It's my pleasure. It's been a real pleasure today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me anytime. All right, Phil, just some of your initial reaction from our conversation today with Dr. Mithil. Uh, what would be the number one thing a podcast host would want to have in their guests, right? The ability to tell stories, Absolutely. right? And uh, just so impressive uh, from Dr. Mithil uh, um, to be able to weave that narrative from childhood all the way through, you know, to his training and uh, ultimately finding his call. Um, we're very fortunate to have mitochondria be at the at the center of that, and uh, to end on that tremendous message of hope. Yes, that's, I know something, Brian. We talk about a lot at UMDF, and how do we continue to you know message that to, to the community? It's incredibly important that they hear it, not just from us, right, but from leaders in the field. And uh, yep, uh, very very thankful to, to have them be a part of our community. Yeah, you know, talking a lot about empathy early on, and um, it's I, I'm always inspired and amazed. Our, our community, this is an attribute that's just pervasive across um, the patient community, our friends in industry, and of course our our docs who who wake up every day kicking down doors to figure these things out. Um, empathy is always at the center of that. That's just something that makes me very proud. I, that's why I like to showcase it to yep. our community so that they know this is how our docs are wired. Um, you know, it's funny in, in the spirit of our metaphysical theme from the beginning, I wrote this down. I, I'm always like amazed at kind of the sliding doors, opportunities in our lives, like, but for that little moment, where would we be right now? And I, I love that story about Russ Sinedo behind him at the conference. <laughs> and we go to the booth where our staff is there talking about our conference and Russ pushing Dr. Mithil to come to our conference. He wins a scholarship at the conference. My goodness, he's joining our SMAB yeah. this summer. Like, how fantastic is that? And I know I talk a lot about but for UMDF, but for this doctor, but for that moment. But in some respects, it's true. Like, all these little things are meaningful. They're all important. It's a plea for me to our donor community, to our volunteers. When you're stepping up to support this organization, you're helping power things like sending our staff to that conference to have a booth to meet this doc who's dedicated his 
life to these patients that we serve, those little things add up. They're big things. They really do. Uh, it's, a, it's a reminder that every interaction is an opportunity, right, to, to leave an impression upon someone that uh, you you never know how that may come back around, right, and then just uh, strengthen the overall cause. So um, well said. Well, I'm grateful for our interaction with Dr. Miffel today, and special thank you to him for joining us. Always grateful for my time with you, Dr. Yeski, and, and carving out some time for this important work among all the other great things you're doing. Of course, we can hear this podcast and all the great folks that we talk to on our YouTube channel and brand new on Spotify, Amazon, Apple. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to say this. Wherever you can find your podcast, yeah. <laughs> you can find the powerhouse. So check out Dr. Yeski, myself, and all of our wonderful guests. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Right. Oh, my gosh. You're so good, Phil. Okay. All right. I think we need the outro music. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you.